Thank you, Vito, and uh, everybody from the uh, Italian chapter for the opportunity to present this work. It is a work that I did in collaboration with uh, my previous uh, advisor, Kanye Vashasita, also with uh, Professor Jettel Halls from Norway and Philip Pigo in Kaiserslautern. Um, recently, I have moved to the Polytechnic of Bari, so I'm really glad to be joining the Italian chapter. Um, and this, I will present these works based on the archive paper that we have uh, submitted a couple of months ago, and also a work that we have submitted to be applied and has been published recently. Um, okay, good. So the overview of my talks, the following, the main message here is that I want to present two main tricks like the interaction between spin waves and topological magnetic textures. More specifically, what I want to show is that in non-collinear ferromagnets, such as Kagome and ferromagnets, it is possible to move domain walls and control the direction of motion by controlling the frequency of the incident spin waves. So depending on how you apply your spin waves, you can move this forward or backwards. And this is quite interesting because it is a phenomenon that is not observed in collinear ferromag ferromagnets. And I was, I would also like to mention a little bit of the frequency multiplication in topological magnetic textures, which may have quite interesting applications for future uh, spintronic devices. Now, my main motivation is to say that usually schemions and domain walls are used as uh, memory units, right? You can move them in racetracks and everything, but actually there are a lot more than just memory units. They have their own excitation modes that has a lot of effect on their dynamics. And the number of applications that has been growing with um, using these magnetic excitations is quite uh, impressive. We have, for example, the use for schemes in sensors, in microwave generators and sensors as uh, the group of Giovanni Finocchio has shown. Uh, you can also use, for example, the main walls as spin wave guides and they have also been shown to even work when the domain walls are uh, curved. So that really means that we can start exploiting like this ex extra um, degrees of freedom of these topological textures. And even for neuromorphic applications, for example, whenever you consider reservoir computing, uh, we have to take into account the excitation modes of schemes and domain walls. And these will have uh, really nice results that we can explore. And I mean, there is much more. There is work, for example, in trying to save entropic information bits in these ischemians and um, many, many others. Now, starting with the domain walls in Kagome and ferromagnets, the main idea here is that non-collinear ferromagnets present a bunch of new phenomena that is not appear in collinear ferromagnets. So a basic idea is that as any other ferromagnet, we have fast dynamics, we have robustness against external perturbations, we have noise rate fields, which also allows a miniaturization of your devices. And unlike collinear ferromagnets, which are described by only two sublattices, or in other words, only one nail vector, these non-collinear and ferromagnets, or more specifically the Kagome and ferromagnets, they need at least three sublattices to describe your system. So instead of one nail vector, you have two nail vectors. And that gives a bunch of whole new phenomena. So that has been explored quite extensively recently, for example, in manganese, iridium, manganese, tin, and many others, manganese, germanium. They have shown, for example, to um, obtain like really strong spin hole effect. You can do a spin arm torque induced magnetization switch. You can observe pyofermions on these materials. And even the detection and creation by temperature effects, all due to this very interesting property of the material that uh, has three sublattices and can be divided quite well. Now, concerning the bidirectional control of spin wave driven domain walls, what I have shown is that according to the frequency that you apply, your domain wall may move away from the source or towards the source. So there is a threshold frequency that below that the domain walls move um, away from the source. That means that most of the spin waves are reflected 
or above the threshold frequency, the domain walls move towards the source because you have mostly transmitted spin waves. Now, why is this different from collinear and ferromagnets? Mainly because you have now three and not two spin wave bands. More importantly, you have a non-dispersive band. You have here this flat band here, which in the domain wall, they get coupled. And this coupling produces a frequency dependent potential. So if you try here to plot the frequency, uh, the, the potential in the domain wall for these coupled uh, spin waves, we see that it depends on the frequency. So for a low frequency band, you see that most of these spin waves would be reflected, while for a high frequency band, uh, a high frequency excitation, most of the spin waves get transmitted. In the high frequency, we obtain back the collinear and ferromagnet regime. So that's why like, it's so different from the collinear because it can actually change your behavior with the applied frequency. And then this shows that we can control the motion of the domain wall by changing the frequency of the applied. Now, going towards non-collinear, sorry, non-linear behavior of topological magnetic detectors, we also see that essentially the dynamics of these topological textures is non-linear. That gives rise of a bunch of uh, phenomena concerning their frequencies because we can go beyond the linear excitation, right? So we have shown that you can excite these modes by parametric excitation when excitation is uh, excited by applying a multiple of the frequency. There is also a recent work in which they show you can have a frequency calm. So by applying a frequency much higher than the magnum gap, if this, this applied the field, uh, this applied perturbation is high enough, you produce a calm because there is other excitation modes excited, which has a distance of the breathing mode of the schemium. So if you have a schemium, you can produce this frequency calm. And here we present this our prediction that it can also excite these topological textures by applying fractions of the eigen frequencies. And that has several advantages compared, for example, to the parametric excitation. Now, going a little bit more focused in schemians, even though the theory can work for droplets, for domain walls, for any localized magnetic uh, topological object, in schemians, we'll have several high um, order modes. So beyond the really mode, we also have the gyrotropic mode, which is a translational mode. We we'll have the lift go, we we'll have the triangular and so forth that correspond to changes in shape of your schemium. This frequency of the excitation modes depend on the material. So for example, here depends on the DMI, but it can also be changed by magnetic field, by temperature, which means that these frequencies are actually tunable. So that's very important. And due to the nonlinear behavior of your system, if we apply any frequency at all, we we'll always observe the generation of harmonics. That means that for any applied frequency, you'll excite twice that frequency, three times that frequency. And due to the nonlinearity, usually you have a decrease in the amplitude of these modes. However, and that's what I have shown is that whenever one of these harmonics coincides with the natural frequency of a system, you have a resonance at that, at that point. And then this means that with a fraction of your, of your eigenfrequency, you can excite that eigenfrequency. We have shown that this method can actually be even more efficient than linear excitation. So for example, in this micromagnetic simulation, we apply the frequencies at different point, at different frequencies and uh, with the same amplitude. And we show that here, why for at the same frequency you obtain somewhere like here, when applied half of the frequency or one third of the frequency or even one quarter of the frequency, you can excite sometimes even more than at the same frequency. The behavior is even more uh, emphasize whenever you try to excite the elliptical mode, for example. So we can clearly see that applying fractions of the frequency, you can excite higher order modes independently of actually the symmetries of your mode. Above a critical field, it's more efficient than the linear excitation. And uh, well, 
more importantly for applications, you can use lower frequencies, which usually in experiments are preferred because then you can use um, more uh, easier ways to excite. And another very interesting thing is that you can excite these modes by applying frequency below the magnum gap. That means that away from your texture, no instabilities will be excited. Unlike whenever you do parametric excitation that once you're applying frequencies above the magnum continuum, you may excite some uh, instabilities due to grains and et cetera. This will not happen if you apply frequencies below the magnum continuum. So clearly the uh, excitation with fractions is um, has some advantages compared to parametric excitations. And now to conclude my talk, I just want to mention briefly that uh, our main result was that in domain walls for Kagomer and ferromagnets or nonlinear, uh, non collinear ferromagnets, you can move uh, domain walls by changing the frequency of your applied field, which has applications, for example, in insulator uh, spintronics. And we also show that when excite uh, topological textures by using fractions of the excitation modes. And these propose them as immaterial tunable frequency multipliers. Now, this also has application, for example, in uh, sphinctronic devices when you're thinking of parametrons, when you need to excite with different frequencies. So nowadays people try to excite with twice the frequency in which uh, you can obtain two phases but the same can be done by applying half of the frequency or a third of the frequency. So it can give more freedom to your phases that you want to excite. And with that, I would like to thank all of you and of course the, my colleagues that helped in my work. So for the bidirectional motion, I would like to mention Professor Jettel Halls and Akshay Salma. And for the work for the frequency multipliers, I would like to mention Philip Fijo, Morteza Moseni, Ross Napan, and Jonas Nothelfer. And of course, my findings. So thank you very much. <laughs>